Welcome back uh, to the e-learning session with VTU. Today we are at the part where we are almost concluding the first module of water supply and, bill, um, and services. Uh, in the initial classes, what I basically showed you or gave you an introduction to was how exactly we had uh, uh, you know, had some kind of uh, respect with respect to sanitation and its development, health and hygiene, urban and rural sanitation system which was brought up in the first part of the module 1. Module 1 part 2 which basically involved water supply began with sources of water supply. It had quantity of water, quality of water and how exactly we assessed water in terms of different usages in terms of standards. And then we saw water being treated with different uses and how it was stored and pumped. Today we are going to also look at the final part of uh, water distribution which is through fixtures and fittings. And then we will also see a couple of schematic diagrams and how we are going to efficiently use water in our residential buildings along with by concluding it with calculation of a water tank. With that we will end today's um, class and also module 1. Uh, let me just continue with the class. Uh, here we are at the conclusion session of module 1 <coughs> of water supply. Uh, this part basically involves how we are going to convey water after it is through the distribution networks into our residential buildings or even to our sources. So, consumers who are wanting to have any kind of water supply facility to their buildings have to apply for water connection to local authorities. It could be either through the municipal corporation or to any kind of corporation. So, a water connection would have certain components. So, basically first component is a ferrule, goose neck, service pipe, a stop cock and a water meter. So, this is a ferrule, then we have a goose neck, that is a goose neck, then we have a service pipe, that is a road surface that you see, this is a section of how exactly a communication pipe and a service pipe are connected. This is a perp property boundary of a consumer with a meter there and that is connected to another valve there. So, that is the stop cock which is right before the meter and from there from the water main that is the ferrule, the water meter and then we have the underground sump and then the overhead water tank from where the water is distributed into our buildings. Components of a water connection basically as I mentioned the first part is a ferrule. The ferrule is a water supply main which is always held under high pressure and hence the connection from this is always done by uh, an equipment called as ferrule. It is a right angle sleeve made either of brass or gun metal. It is joined to a hole <coughs> like that and drilled into the water main. 10 to 15 meters mm in dia. The service pipe takes off from the ferrule and the pressure in the domestic supply and the equal distribution among the house connection are affected by adjusting this ferrule opening. Normally the ferrule opening is equal in area to the area of flow in the communication pipe. So, if our communication pipe is around 10 to 50 mm dia, then our ferrule pressure is also going to be as much only. So, that is the outlet and that is the pipe which is going to let, let in and let out. The next is a gooseneck. A gooseneck is a small sized curved pipe which is made out of any flexible material about 75 centimeter in length. It forms a flexible connection between the water main and the service pipeline. It is provided to accommodate the possible movement that might happen through displacement of settlement or it might also take place between the water pipeline as well as the service pipeline which could be happening due to the water pressure and also to prevent any kind of damage to our connection system. Then we have our service pipeline. This is a GI pipe, galvanized iron pipe made of uh, iron so less than 50 mm diameter which supplies water to the building. It is connected to the main through a goose neck and then to the ferrule directly. 
And then we have a stop cock that is a stop cock, it stops or controls the flow of water to the building. It is provided before the water meter, that is a water meter. It is housed in a masonry chamber, that is a masonry chamber that you see with a removable cover which controls the flow of water. Water meter is an item which is basically used to measure and record the quantity of water which is consumed in the house and it is fitted into the service pipe within the boundary wall. Then we have a tap, water tap, these are walls which are provided at the end of the service pipe for withdrawing the water at the consumers houses. Most common of them that we know is a bib cock. The schematic diagram of a water supply connection. Now, this is a uh, section of uh, how exactly the whole water supply connection is. That is the road, then you have a footpath okay? and then at the footpath there would be a union, a union of a ferrule. You see this is a ferrule which comes and directs us from the municipal water main. Then there will be a goose pipe here right? and then it connects you to the union. So, this union would pass through your boundary wall that is your compound wall into your wheel valve. There is a wheel valve and a water meter before the water enters into your residences and that is basically a combined system which basically sees as to how exactly you are going to get your direct supply of water from where it is pumped onto your overhead tank okay, as, uh, sorry or it is either let into your underground storage tank through your float wall totally depending on how exactly you are connecting your whole water distribution system either pumped in to your sump or pumped up to your overhead tank. The water supply and distribution equipments in a building are uh, basically categorized into two types. One is called as pipes and pipe fittings, second is equipments which are used to control the flow and the use of water called as control valves, stop cocks, taps, showers, etc. Now, for water supply in a building, pipes of various materials like lead, copper, mild steel, galvanized iron, PVC and CPVC are used. In our country, we basically use GI pipes, PVC pipes and CPVC pipes because these are what are used mostly in terms of these diameters that is 12, 20, 25, 32, 38, 50 mm internal diameters. Now, what is a galvanized iron pipe? It is economical as I mentioned earlier and it is easily laid underground. These are strong, durable and resist all the water pressure and can withstand any kind of external pressure and shocks. They are protected with a zinc coating uh, also called as galvanizing that is why the name galvanized iron and these are rigid and not flexible hence they cannot be bent. Therefore, these pipe fittings are used at both the ends with threading on its external surfaces. PVC pipes are cheaper, they are more flexible, they are lighter in weight and easy to cut, they are easy to handle and work with. They are used for normal water supply but avoided for hot water supply. They have good resistance to light acids and non-corrosive therefore can be laid underground. They do not need threading, instead joints are made by gluing the pipes and fittings with specially made adhesives known as PVC cement. We have CPVC which is chlorinated polyvinyl chloride pipes, they are cheaper, lighter in weight and also tougher. They are strong, rigid and lower in terms of construct, uh, sorry, transportation as well as labor cost. They are easy to cut, join and install, it works with cold wedding and uh, it is very simple and quick hence speeds up all the installation processes, it retards bacterial growth and hence keeps the water quality very healthy therefore most suitable for drinking purposes. So, all the drinking water pipelines are basically CPVC pipes here in India. Durability is high and the cost, initial cost is lower and low maintenance cost. The corrosion is resistant with respect to these pipes and the friction is also very smooth. That is why this production of this kind of a, a pipeline is very energy efficient as well as environmental friendly because it also resists bacterial growth in it. But the disadvantage of this pipe is they are affected by prolonged exposure to sunlight and UV radiation. Thus, they have to be seen that they are protected from this by putting them through exterior grade latex paints. 
this pay, these pipes also expand and contract more than the metallic pipes. So, when provided as longer pipes, there should be provision for expansion and contraction by using loops and bends. Well, cutting care should be taken to avoid cracking because sharp edge tools have to be used here. Then we also have pipe fittings. Now, when we are talking about fittings here, we are basically talking about the connecting pipeline uh, fittings or joining pipeline fittings. So, they are available in various sizes and shapes to match our consideration and need coupling. That is a coupling. A coupling connects two pipes to each length otherwise. So, if the size of the pipe is not the same, the pipe may be fit into a reducing coupling or a reducer or an adapter. This is an elbow. It is a pipe fitting installed between two different lengths of pipe or a tubing and they allow a change of direction. Usually a 90 degree or 45 degree change is allowed with through all this 22.5 degree elbows. We have something called as union, they are similar to couplings because here they are also going to connect two different pipelines through quick and convenient connection and disconnection of pipes and they are very easy to replace also. A union basically provides a simple transition which allows easy connection or disconnection even in terms of future times. A standard union is made in three parts, it consists of a nut, a female end and a male end. So, there is a nut, a female end and a male end. That is a cross, cross fittings are also called as four way fittings. If a branch line passes completely through this T, the fitting becomes a cross. A cross has one inlet and three outlets or three outlets and one in, uh, three, uh, three uh, inlets and one outlet. That is a cap. Cap is usually liquid or gas tight which covers the end of one end of the pipe. A cap is usually used like a plug. That is a plug. It closes off the end of a pipe and it is similar to a cap. It is fits inside a fitting it is going to be mated to. That is a reducer. A reducer allows for a change in pipe size to meet hydraulic flow requirements of the system or to adapt to existing different sizes. And that is a T shape. A T is used for connecting pipes of different diameters or for changing the direction of pipe runs. That is a nipple. It is a short stub of a pipe. Nipples are commonly used for plumbing and hoses and secondly as walls for funnels and pipes. That is a Y fitting, a Y W Y E, a fitting with three openings. It is used to create a branch line which has a side inlet pipe entering at a 45 degree or an angle other than the 90 degree. So, a standard Y shaped fitting which allows one pipe to be joined to another at a 45 degree angle is called as a Y fitting. These are the other different types of pipe fittings. This is a reducing couple either to reduce this uh, you know flow of water, a standard T a 45, a spigot by socket 45, street 45. This is a male adapter, it is a standard 90 or elbow, a bull head, many sizes are available. The last number is the middle socket size, this. The street 90, it is a spigot by slip socket, a standard 90 or an elbow again. We also have couplers which basically have uh, two different pipelines coming and sitting together against a coupler, an elbow, a door elbow if in case there is a door there and this is basically closed for air, a double door T or also called as door cross, a reducing T where the diameter suddenly changes, a single Y, a double Y, vent cowl. This is basically for ventilation, an offset, a bent 45, an FTA and an MTA. Other than this, we also have control equipments. The first control equipment that we are going to look at is a stop valve. A stop valve is basically a gun metal which regulates both the volume and pressure of water and it can be fixed both horizontally as well as vertically. 
it is there is a spindle provided and with a wheel shaped knob by which it can be lifted up and down to check the flow of water. It is mostly used outside the building. That is a stop clock, you see a stop clock. This is same as a stop valve, but much smaller in size, made of brass and has both inlet and outlet openings exactly on the opposite directions. It is commonly used inside the buildings, it regulates the water supply to different sanitary equipment such as wash basins, flushing, cisterns, geysers, water coolers, etc. And that is an angle cock. It is same as a stop clock, stop cock, but inlet and outlet openings are at 90 degrees. We also have taps, taps are also called as bib cocks or bib taps, showers used for bathing purpose, fixed on the wall or sometimes on the ceilings, boil valves used to automatically regulate the flow of water in storage tanks, flushing cisterns, a valve that controls the entry of water into a storage system or a flushing system. Okay. And closing of the supply when the water level in the system has reached a predetermined level, sometimes also called as a flat operated valve. What happens within a building then? So, once all these pipelines, once it net enters into our network, there is something called as the piping system. The water supply from all the mains to the buildings through one of the following system depending on the pressure of the water in the main supply comes and gets connected to a water meter. And once it gets connected to a water meter, it again gets branched off, one is taken to the kitchen and another is laid vertically to feed the overhead tank which is also called as the rising main. The branch that is taken to the kitchen is called as direct supply and the branch which is rising vertically is referred to as indirect supply. So, what is direct supply? Water which is supplied directly to the kitchen or to other points and fixtures at all levels directly from the municipal main is called as direct supply. If adequate water pressure is available around the clock, minimum pressure available with limit the number of flows, convenient and economical to users. Whereas indirect supply is when the adequate water pressure is not sufficient for direct supply water from mains, it is either pumped into the water head tank usually situated at the top of your building or stored into the underground storage tank from where the water is pumped to the overhead tank then supplied through gravity or either of the two systems or both of the systems are used. Now, how do we supply from overhead tank? If water pressure is sufficient to reach to the top at least for a limited period of time and to meet requirements during the non-supply hours, tank is filled with direct connection from mains, supply to the kitchens are directly taken from the main or taps and toilets are connected to the tank. From the underground or the sump tank, when water pressure is low, the water is stored in underground tanks and then pumped to the overhead tank. Two to three storied houses use direct as well as underground overhead tank system to get clearer drinking water. Tall buildings need to use water from tank for all their requirements. So, storage of water in the buildings. In the buildings, Basically, storage of water is required for two purposes. One is to supply water during non-supply hours. Second is to reduce the maximum demand rate of the water mains. Third is when we need water, there is interruption, there should be damage or whatever. When we need to store all the water during such kind of emergencies, that is when storage of water is needed. So, storage of water within the building premises is necessary as the municipal supplies are not available throughout the clock. So, storage capacity depends on hours of supply, rate of supply, demand pattern of the building and fire storage which is required depending on overhead storage or underground storage. So, what are the general requirements of a storage tank? The storage tank should be watertight, it should be non-corrosive. It should be non-toxic, smooth with the surface inside, vent pipes for ventilation, overflow pipe, score pipe which is basically with a plug at the bottom to drain all the water from the floor 
and it to be at the lowest point because if in case we have to clean the water or clean the tank, then the score pipe is one of the most necessary requirement. All tanks have to include a roof. The roof is to be designed with respect to contamination which is going to enter into the tank even during a heavy storm. So, what basically is the component of water storage? Underground storage tanks are basically made of RCC or brick masonry and they have to be structurally designed to withstand the pressure developed by earth. It should be filled with municipal supply inlets. The up, uh, overhead storage tank can be made out of RCC, PVC, mild steel tanks or high density polyethylene tanks also called as HTPE tanks. They should be properly located so as to safely transmit their loads. <coughs> These are overhead tanks, that is a PVC uh, concrete tank and that is a section of a water tank which is a brick water tank. So, you have a 230 mm brick wall here, waterproofing is needed and a neat cement rendering is needed. The slab, you have an access cover, a top slab. And then this slab will also have an access, so the ladder should also be provided. There is a smooth cement plaster uh, rendering which is provided and uh, location of an overhead tank is basically supposed to be located at the highest point of uh, building as far as possible it should be directly above your bathing area and WC spaces to reduce the pipe length as well as to save the plumbing costs. The tank bottom should be elevated from roof surface and the components of an overhead tank are inlet pipe which provides with the control valve. It has regulation of water tank and ball valve inside the tank, it has an overflow pipe. In case the ball valve fail, fails, the pipe is normally made to project beyond the nearest external wall, manhole cover to enable a person to enter for cleaning, repair and access ladder. I provided both outside as well as inside, a cleaning eye or a plug provided at bottom to wash out the sludge, distribution pipe to carry down water to different outlets and water distribution and supply to various requirements. Basically, you have to make sure that the pipelines would have a minimum 25 mm dia depending on the number of outlets to be served could be 30 to 38 or 50 mm dia. And most of them are because they are supply and distribution pipelines, they are basically supplied to sanitary, bathing and washing equipments and outlets. There might be a need for two or more distribution pipelines and every line is provided with a control valve. From distribution pipeline, it branches out a 12 mm pipeline which is connected to all the outlet points like bip box, shower um, etcetera. The routes of distribution as well as the branch pipe should be taken care to ensure that there is the shortest distance possible with minimum possible bends because the lesser the bends and the lesser the pipe length, the plumbing cost is lesser. The water outlets for equipments like wash basin, flushing cistern, geysers, water coolers are to be provided with a stop valve on their connection, this helps in stopping the water supply temporarily to that particular equipment at times of leakage. As the water comes into our homes, the smaller size pipelines are used. Typically pipes from the main water supply to our homes is 3 fourth inches to 1 inches in size. Once inside the homes, the pipe is reduced as it goes to various fixtures. Typically half inch piping is used, as the pipe is reduced, it increases the pressure of water in the system. Constant water pressure is important so that we get water when we need it and when we need it in our buildings. So, these are some of the schematic diagrams of how exactly we you know duplicate a uh, water uh, storage tank. This is a steel overhead tank, you see a small cock wall that is to pressurize and keep the maintain the level of water pressure there. So, that is the water inlet, that is the control valve at the bottom and the control valve on top. You have a brick wall upon which there is a steel beam, there is a cleaning plug 
which is you know removed in case you have to clean this and the control valve is also provided on the other side. So, there is no outlet again after the inlet comes in. This is one terrace pan <coughs> of a storage tank. So, you have an access cover, you have direct supply branch pipeline, control ball which I showed you already that is the storage tank. You have a control valve here, an access cover and that is the wall. Okay. So, you will also have an overflow pipe which is going to be on the external wall and all these pipelines would be at least 25 inches dia distribution. <coughs> this is the ground water plan, uh, ground flow plan of the kitchen as well as the bathing area and uh, WC. So, you have a flushing system here, you have a commode, you have a wash basin, you have uh, a bathing unit and then a sink. So, how are all these things connected? So, imagine if this is a brick wall that is the ventilation. You first need to have indirect supply branch pipeline to store all the uh, from your storage tank. Okay. And then you will also have a distribution branch pipeline number 2 which is going to be against your wall systems. So, that is going to connect to your sink and then to your wash basin. Next you have only your inlets like that which is connecting through and through the pipeline 1 and pipeline 2 and then you also have a pipe outlet which is for uh, the sanitary pipeline. Then you have your taps, you have your distribution pipelines, you have your showers. So, all of them are connected and they reach onto this particular point from where it connects and then it leaves your spaces. That is a section of the <coughs> over it tank. You have the overhead tank there, you have a shower and then you also have your wash basin there. So, there is there is a pillar cock there, right? you have a web tap there, you have shower cubicle. So, all of them are connected like that. So, that is the pipeline that you see. So, that is the pipeline that you see and then from there all these pipelines are connected to the main external st stop wall and then connected to your distribution pipelines. And that is your cistern, your flushing tanks which are provided at flexible pipelines and you have a 12 meter 12 mm dia pipeline. So, <coughs> to go back to how we began with, we have a source of water enters into a filtration uh, plant the raw intake, the water gets treated, enters into your water main or utility, enters into your residences and then gives you, you know, your consumer end water or if you have to curb, depending on what, how exactly your mains are connected to the curb or you either to the utility or to the owner directly, you are providing your water distribution. So, water distribution system basically would have a source, a treatment plant, a storage tank and a main pipeline which distributes the, uh, the network. So, pumps and walls are located at variety of locations throughout the distribution system. And if you actually look at how exactly the source is, this is the source, this is a water body, you have a drinking water treatment plant, then it goes to the reservoir. Then it enters into each of the districts okay? and there would be treatment plants depending on the size of the districts. Then they would be tapped into each of the districts. Once it enters into the uh, main individual network, so what happens is whatever the pump connects to the storage reservoir which is a water tank there and from there there would be grey water tank which is collected because of uh, garden irrigation or even if there is a, you know a runoff from the roof line and all of that. So, all that is collected and kept as grey water. Then this is blue water which is basically used for other purposes. The grey water is also connected. So, there is another grey water pump, a drainage wall for it which again connects you to the drainage 
it is treated with UV and then stored and probably used uh, with your flushing cisterns or something for your uh, second usage. So, this is also another uh, diagram where uh, we actually see how a water supply is provided at an internal uh, residence. So, <coughs> you have cold water, hot water, natural gas, vent system and drain systems are the five pipelines that basically work in any building services. So, we would have a water meter which is connected to the outdoor plumbing system and from where it enters into all your supply pipelines. So, from your supply pipelines, all your supply pipelines make sure that you at least have some kind of a vent stack from where all your um, vents are connected okay? and that connection is directly on, which reaches onto your main drain. It is connecting to your faucets, to your toilets and also to all your uh, utilitarian spaces. So, this is one uh, image of how exactly the whole pipeline is put up in a swimming pool. So, that is a swimming pool, you have uh, <coughs> you have the main drains there all right and then you also have return walls there On all the return walls are connected to your return lines. So, return lines would have your suction lines which are connected to the pump and the pump is connected to your filter which reaches out onto your reservoir or storage. So, any pool or spa plumbing layout basically would have a storage space that is a pool which would have a main drain all right and from the main drain to the return main drain there would be connection of skimmers, filters and heaters which would be either through drains or pumps and motors would be connected through 3 port or 2 port through your return wall and connected <coughs> onto your main drain. Now, what, what exactly do we mean by efficient use of water. Efficient use of water is basically understanding how much of water is needed for this, how much is it managed and what are the costs and benefits and who pays and gains out of all the productivity and allocativity of water. So, efficient usage of water with respect to each individual and then trying to bring forward the same kind of efficient usage in a society by targeting to fit the water supply as available in terms of good quality as well as prevent any kind of depreciation of natural capital. So, what we have to do is you have to understand that any water cycle would have a natural system okay, and a, a sustainable boundary. So, you have to make sure that this sustainable boundary is basically about how we are going to use the same water supply for transport, for agriculture for industries, for public supply, leisure and energy. So, there is a distance that you have to achieve in terms of a boundary and these are the targets based on which uh, we are using it or we are polluting the water for usage. So, totally depending on the typical water usage which I mentioned earlier is around 135 liters per day bathing showering, toilet flushing, washing of clothes, outdoor watering, dish washing and drinking are the main typical water usage facilities through which we are efficiently using water. Otherwise, there is also evaporation, precipitation and effluent which comes out of your waste stages. So, you have to make sure how exactly you are going to systemize this water right from the sources and try to see as to how you can efficiently use it for saving. So, compared to traditionally there's, there's, there are two different ways in which we look at this. One is the residential usage which we already saw other than that there is also an agricultural or irrigational uh, usage of water where according to the irrigational methods at least drip irrigation method is one of the way in which 40 percent of the water can be saved. And why is water needed for us to save? Because we need to understand, you know, uh, investing in water efficient goods like shower heads, taps, toilets and washing machines is always conveniently better because a leaking tap can save a, a waste up to 15 liters of water per day. So, you have to make sure you are, uh, you know, you are not showering on uh, right under a shower cubicle, but maybe using a jug and a towel, uh, you know. Mm, 
tub and also trying to see how exactly we can you know save water in terms of its quantity and quality in terms of each of your usages that I already mentioned. Other than that, if we have to actually understand efficient usage of water, we have to first understand the objective of water where can it be used indoor, where can it be used outdoor and how much of loss is developed in terms of it and how much is it benefiting the environment. So, based on which a variant can be developed and then try to see how much of carbon footprint can you achieve by reducing your targets by including some kind of a green action for your society as well as in any kind of a public sector body. So, this is the way in which we can actually try to efficiently use water in our everyday use. Other than that, uh, the last part of uh, this module is basically trying to understand how to calculate the capacity of water tanks in your everyday usage. As we all know that water is calculated in terms of volume, the volume means either in liters or gallons. Right. So, it is cubic meters basically put forward as cubic meters. So, cubic feet is also uh, one of the volumes. So, total volume of water, water is calculated as length into breadth into depth. So, requirement of any water tank is calculated by calculating its volume by multiplying its length, width and depth in dimensions. Water has a lot of contaminants as we know bacteria, virus, algae, changes in pH values, accumulation of minerals, accumulated gases and all of that which affects the construction of the cost. So, you have to keep all of these things in mind also when you are calculating the whole construction of the tank. So, while uh, looking into the construction one thing that you have to see is the materials of construction which should not be affected by bird droppings or animal fecus or even inclusion of any mineral or gaseous accumulation like for example, the Bhopal gas tragedy was one of the um, you know uh, a tragedy which basically brought in a lot of gaseous accumulation into the whole city. So, in case anybody consumes that water in case that mineral enters into our pipeline systems also uh, it is going to turn fatal. So, you have to also make sure you understand the location of your tanks. The location could be very close to the entry of properties and water tankers should be able to access in case the water has scarcity there. So, how do you calculate capacity of the tank? Total quantity of water as I mentioned is length into width into depth of the tank in feet and the results will basically come in cubic area. So, into 28 liters. <coughs> So, why are we taking 28 liters? Because according to Indian standard, uh, 135 liters of water is needed per person per day. So, we have to at least store 28 liters of water per, you know, um, uh, storage <coughs> as one of our concerns. So, how 135 liters? As we know, drinking water takes up 5 liters, cooking takes 5 liters, bathing 85, washing clothes 30, cleaning and maintenance around 10 liters. So, multiplied by the members in a family. So, so for a family of 4 members in case 135 liters is into 4 gives you around 540 liters per day for a family of 4, but if in case you have 10 people, so it will be 1300. 13,350 uh, liters per day for a family of 10. Now, you have to calculate a density here. The density comes in meter cube according to the standard 1 meter cube is 1000 liters, right. So, 1 liter is 1 by 1000 meter cube which is also equal to 0 0.001 meter cube. So, for a family of 4, 0 0.001 into 540 which gives you 0 0.54 meter cube and for a family of 10, 1.34. So, which is going to be the volume of the tank per the members in a residence. So, in order to get the size of this water tank, you need to mention at least one dimension that is length, width or depth of the water tank when you are calculating it. So, what you have to see is you have to at least know one of the dimension either length or width or depth of the whole thing and you have to also keep in mind that there are supposed to be manholes, there is supposed to be an outlet as well as an inlet in a water tank. So, for calculation of the depth, Depth is the volume of quantity which is to be assumed could be 1 meter. Okay. So, formula of volume is area into depth. So, area of tank for 10 people is 1.35 by depth, 1.35 by 1 because depth is 1. So, 1.35 meter square should be the area for 10 people. 
Likewise, for the amount of people or the members that is in your family, you can actually calculate the whole area of rectangle based assuming length to be 2 times the breadth, right. So, therefore, 1.35 meter square is equal to 2 times breadth into breadth, right. So, 1.35 meter square is 2 breadth square, which is 2 b square is equal to 1.35 meter square, which would come to 0 0.82 meter. So, length is 2 times breadth which would be 1.64. So, adding an additional 300 mm for free flow, you would get the whole quantity of water tank size. So, it would come around 3375 liters for at least 5 people. So, totally depending on that you can start your calculation and work on how exactly you would like to bring out your areas of your water tank. With this we are done with module 1 water supply uh, and then uh, right from the sources of water to its treatment to its conveyance and then how exactly it is distributed and brought forward into your residences was seen in this particular module. I hope you have uh, you have cleared all your uh, you know um, doubts with this class. Thank you so much.